Welcome to God of Breath. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Roger Robinson. I met Roger seven years ago at the Boilermaker 15K. He was part of the discussion panel. Wow, what a panel. I didn't know much about Roger, but I learned that he's an historian about the running culture. Plus, he's a writer for the Runner's World, among many other publications. His voice is, can be heard on many shows about running. I am delighted to have Roger on the show. Will, thank you. <laughs> I'm delighted to be on the show. <laughs> Excellent. Roger, let's get started by telling us where were you born, a little bit about your childhood. Oh, golly, that's, that, that's a long time ago. I thought we were going to talk, talk about the Boilermaker <laughs> and the voice. But uh, I was born in England and grew up during World War II. Two, my, fir my first year, so there was no sport. Uh, but in, when I was about eight, nine, we lived in the London suburbs very near a running track called Motspa Park, which in those days was famous because it was the best cinder track in the London area. And London University athletes used to train there. And I saw some of the really great athletes. You know, as a little boy, I saw Arthur Wint, the great, the great Jamaican 880 runner, mm -hmm. and MacDonald Bailey, the, the Trinidadian but also British sprinter. And I saw Roger Bannister in the years before he became the legend that he was. I saw him run a three-quarter mile world record in, I think it was 1951, just, and I was 10 years old. Just to let the audience of Roger was the first man to break the four-minute mark. Yeah, that's right. He uh, broke that was 60 minute. years 60 ago. years ago last week, May the 6th, 1954. Uh, I just got a new cat and I called it Bannister. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was the culture I grew up in. You know, I loved soccer, of course, as, as, all, as all little English boys did. Uh -huh. uh, but I discovered that I had no talent for anything except running for quite a long time. Uh, and so I used to go out on the Motspur Park track, which is open to the public, and run three miles so as, as quite a small boy, round and round the track. Uh -huh. Of course, that's what I like doing. And, and, and that led on to school cross country and... And I, and I got into running at, at that time, as early as that. Excellent. Did you go to school in England? What did you study? Yeah, I was always, the subject I was always best at was, was English and English literature. And I eventually went on and became a professor of, of that. So, so got scholarships to Cambridge University and things like that. Uh, and that was, that was my professional career because obviously in those days you couldn't make a living out of running in any way. You couldn't make a living from being a runner or from doing anything else. People don't quite understand that. If you wrote about running and were paid for it, you would be banned as a runner in those days. Oh, uh, if, you gave a speech, if you gave a speech or gave a radio broadcast and got paid for it, you could be banned as an amateur because everything was strictly amateur. You were not allowed to make it money in any way connected with running. That's how it was. We didn't complain about it. And I just loved doing all those things. But my career turned out to be a teaching academic scholarly one. Okay. In those days, were you a good runner? Where were you? A... Never very good. No, no. I was persistent, Will. Was, <laughs> and, and in a way, that's a message to, to many runners. You may not have great immediate talent, but if you're prepared to keep doing the work. And I, I was pr fairly good at school, but not outstandingly good in inter school races. When I went to Cambridge, it happened to be a really strong period for Cambridge University running at that stage. Mm -hmm. I'm the number three in our cross-country team, for instance, in my last year was an Australian called Herb Elliott, who happened to have the world record for the mile and the 1,500 metres <laughs> and had won the Olympic gold medal the year before he came to Cambridge. That's how strong we were. We had a really strong group. I didn't even make the first team when I was at university. When I carried on, I went back to the university to do my research. Then I was better and won the British University's Championship. Okay. 25 or 26, though, okay. it didn't all happen at 18. You could okay. just, just keep going. So at 25, 26, you had that first championship? That yes, I'd, I'd won the championship of an area called Surrey, which is like a state, really, mm -hmm. you know, like winning the New York cross-country mm -hmm. championships in deep snow one time. So that was a funny story because uh, the snow was so bad that winter, 1963, all the football, all the soccer was cancelled. All the sports writers had nothing to do. So they all came to cross country rather grumpily and stood around. So I got, because I won the Surrey, I got this mass coverage on the back page of all the London newspapers. Uh -huh. I was Wenceslas Lass Robinson, who likes it deep and crisp and even, you know, and all, all that kind of, <laughs> all that kind of okay. writing. And the next week they discovered they were much more interested in darts and billiards, which was, which was a lot warmer and drier. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> so. Wow. What was your next 
big breakthrough in running, you know, it's like uh, you really make the headlines. I would, uh, not about, not headlines, um, but I astonished myself and everybody else in 1966 by getting into the England cross-country team and ran for England in, in what was then called the International Cross-Country Championship, now the World Cross-Country Championship. That was a, a, a dream, a fantasy fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, I'd won a book when I was about 16 at school in a race, and we won this book, which was a history of the international cross country. And, and it was like, for me, it was like playing in the World Cup soccer team. You know, oh, it, wow. was, it, it was, it was as, as magic as that. And suddenly here were all, all my heroes, and I was on the same team as they were. And then later, you know, jumping ahead, uh, I then went to New Zealand, and after a rather down period, got, started to run quite well again and run for New Zealand in the World Cross Country. I think I'm the only person to have done both of those things. <laughs> you moved to New Zealand for academic reasons? Yes, I moved to an academic job at the University of Canterbury, first of all, um, as a lecturer in English. I, I'd had a job at the University of Leeds, but I was, I sort of was a bit dissatisfied with England and wanted to go somewhere that was less crowded and where I could live more the kind of life I wanted to lead. And I had a very good friend who was a New Zealander and New Zealand runner. Right. And told me all about it. So moved there in 1968 to a job, and in and in 77, I was getting quite old by then. I was 30, 37. Yeah. Uh, made the New Zealand team for so the like, Olympics, or yes? no, no, no. I was never fast enough on the track. Okay. Never had any finishing speed. If anybody was with me, they could out sprint me. Oh, I, okay. I was born with no fast twitch fibers at all. Interesting. Dead last in every hundred meters race at school. You know, absolutely hopeless. I could, but I could keep going. Okay. So that, that's, that was the story of my running career. And then I had a great period because of my persistence, I think, and maybe genetics, maybe I was a late mature. After I turned 40, uh, then I had a great period because I, I, then I ran my first marathon and that was when I won the Masters at New York and Boston. So your first uh, marathon was New York? Yeah, when 40. I was 41. And yeah. then you did the uh, Boston? Uh, three, about three or four years later, I was okay. 44 by then. And, uh, and won the Masters and set a record. Oh, for the Masters. For the Masters. But I think there's a couple of those records still stand. Uh, that one didn't stand because then some of the really great Masters runners like okay. John Campbell came okay. through and ran quite a bit faster. Right. What I claim on the Boston one is that I was the last non-professional Masters runner. To have that, to have that record, okay. because after that they were, they were full time. I was still, you know, I was academic dean in my university, okay. and so you had to pay your own expenses and everything. Very much so. Sneaked away. Um, Interesting. I was able to run that Boston because it came at Easter, so I could get away from the university. And it's a nice story. The vice chancellor of the university was at, at, at that time a very good humoured and balanced man who was quite interested in sport. And I was dean, so I, had to, I was going to have to miss one of the senior management meetings. And he said, well, you can go provided you wear the university singlet, you know, just as a joke. So I ran the Boston Marathon with Victoria University on my, on my singlet. <laughs> and it was still going around in Fenway Park. Some wit leant out from the crowd and he said, I had a little beard in those days and a hat. And, it was, and he said, go, Victoria, foist woman. <laughs> so, so. I claim to have won the women's race of the Boston Marathon as well as setting the Masters record. <laughs> Interesting. You're now known as a very, very good writer. You do voiceovers. When did you make that transition or were you always doing that? Always, I think. I think because I've always loved writing. When I was 20, 21 and I was running for a little club in England called Guildford, and I used to write the, the club reports for the local newspaper. I wrote in my school magazine. You know, I just always liked writing. And, mm -hmm. Looking back, when I tried to summarize my contribution to running for my bio on the Running Times website, because I'm a senior writer with Running Times, um, I realized that all the jobs that I do, and I've done a lot, they, but they all involve words in some way. You know, I'm a stadium announcer. I was a stadium announcer at the Commonwealth Games twice. I do television commentary. Uh, did that at the Olympics, Commonwealth Games. Uh, I do radio commentary, I write, it's all, it's all words. I mean, there's, there's these two things I love, you know, I love running and I love words, so I shove them together and do the best that, that I can to communicate the sport to people who appreciate yeah. having it described and yes, having it yes. brought to life for them in all these different ways. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, Solomon Butt just had a controversy on the comrades. 
tell us about it and what do you think of it? Because I don't quite understand it. The controversy seems to me from the outside, and I don't know, I've only read about it like you have, Will, a storm in a teacup, very trivial. She wasn't wearing the master's bit on her number or something. It just, it's not that important. I feel really sorry for Zola, but I've never met her, I should say, but mm -hmm. uh, whatever your political views during the apartheid era, to use physical violence against a 16-year-old girl was, in my view, not acceptable mm -hmm. as a way of expressing those political views. And I think she had a terrible time. And then, of course, there was that awful accident of the collision with Olympics, Mary yeah. Decker Slaney in the Olympics, and she's just labelled with that. All the reports on her not wearing the right number in the Comrades Marathon all have the picture of her and Mary Decker. She's stuck with that incident oh, know, for I the know. rest of her life. I feel really sorry for yeah. her. She, she's in, been on the edge of a tragic life, I think. And, yeah. Uh, I don't know her as a person, so that, so I can't judge. Yeah. She's, Very young, still young. She, oh, she was, she was such a tiny girl. I mean, she was 14 or 15 when she yeah, was first yes, running away. Yes, yes, yes. Well, this, well, maybe that story isn't quite over because, like I said, I didn't quite understand it because the people after her had the same situation. It sounded like they should have disqualified everybody, but I'm not sure. Yes, well, you know, you, you try and wear the right number, but... Sometimes you forget. I mean, <laughs> I remember running a race in England once and my 13 or 14 year old son also ran it and just by chance we wore each other's numbers. So when it came to the awards ceremony at the end of the race, he was announced as the race winner. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, I wasn't trying to cheat, but I suppose I should have been disqualified, but, but they didn't disqualify. Well, but South Africa would have disqualified <laughs> yes, they, maybe you. They, <laughs> maybe they would. You, okay. know, you, you know, don't always quite have your mind on these things. Okay, well, as a writer, was there any particular stories that you're really proud of? You know, it was a tough interview or was it a story you really wanted to get and you got it? Yes, well, quite, quite a lot. And one that's quite famous is my account of the 1984 Olympic marathon, the men's marathon, run by Carlos Lopez. And that went into my book called Heroes and Sparrows, which is, which is, which is that, that book. That's, that's the new edition on it. Okay. Um, it the kept, book came out first of in 1986, so that, that account was quite new. That was a very good one. It caught the drama uh, of the race, of a completely unpredictable race. Okay. Um, and then I'm pleased with some of the writing I do with, with Running Times. I did a nice one, came out at the beginning of this year, which went back and tried to reinstate the great American runner Buddy Edlin, who was a real groundbreaker for the American marathon. And he actually moved to England, so I met him and ran against him when mm -hmm. I was still there in the 1960s. And he had the world record for the marathon, and most Americans don't remember that at all. I don't so what that. I did was to write about him and the, the great legendary mythic Ababy Bikila, and wove their two lives together because they ra eventually ran against each other. And I was making the point that when they got to Tokyo, when Bikila really confirmed his place in legend by winning his second Olympic title, actually Edlin had the faster marathon when they went into that race. So people forget how good Edlin was. He got back trouble, he probably overtrained, and he finished an incredibly courageous sixth. In, wow. that, in that marathon. And that's in uh, the magazine Running that's Times? That was in Running Times in January. And, and I've just done one, again, it's, in a way it's a kind of um, reinstatement job, if you like, about uh, an American runner called Bob Shaw, who probably most people will not have heard of, but he's the only American to win the Olympic 5,000 meters. Shaw is fifth, Bailey is sixth, Scholl is moving up, Scholl on the outside, Scholl is coming up on Norfolk, Jazzy's out ahead, Scholl is third, Bailey coming up in black behind, Scholl, Jazzy's out of front, Scholl is closing in on him, Scholl is passing Norfolk, Scholl is second, he's closing up on Jazzy, they're coming around the last turn, here's Scholl trying to catch Jazzy, Jazzy out in front, Scholl coming up on the inside, and Scholl racing by, Scholl of the United States is leading, Scholl is coming in, Scholl is going to win it, Scholl is winning the 5,000, and it's the first American ever to win the 5,000. Everybody remembers Billy Mills yes. winning the 10,000. 10, 10,000, yes. They don't remember, for whatever reason, they don't remember Bob Scholl winning a brilliant race. And in some of the research I did, and I sat there and timed and timed and timed, the, f the finish of, uh, of Mo Farah in 2012. Bob Shaw 
running on wet cinders in the pouring rain, still a cinder track, the last Olympics on cinders, ran his last 300 metres as fast as Mo Farah did in 2012. Oh. On beautiful, impeccable, all-weather all track. That's how fast. So I'm trying to sort of bring him back, back. into runner's consciousness. That's yes. the kind of history that I like to write. It's just, you know, we've forgotten these people. They were great. <laughs> Almost lost era, but gladly you, you're bringing them back. Yes. What really gets you excited? Oh, I, I'm, I'm really excited to meet so-and-so, or I'm really excited to go to... Oh, well, it all, it all does. Uh, I've got to put in a little plug for New Zealand, which I love, and say my favourite running venue is Newtown Park Stadium in Wellington, New Zealand, because it's the only track in the world that has its own chimpanzees. <laughs> and I used to say it's the only track in the world that has its own elephant, but, but the elephant died, unfortunately. The track is immediately adjoining the Wellington Zoo, which is on a hillside above the track, and we used to have the elephant. And as stadium announcer, at the beginning of every season, I would put out an announcement and warn the elephant that the first race was about to begin, because if the starter's gun fired without that warning, she would get... Uh, all frightened and gutted. Oh, what kind of warning? So I would, you... I would just say, I just want to warn the elephant, just want to notify Kamala the elephant that the first race of the season is about to begin. And, and, okay. and, he, she, he, and she would he, observe that. <laughs> She's gone now, but now at three o'clock in the afternoon, every, every Saturday afternoon, the chimpanzees come out on their branches because it's their tea time. And I say it's like, you know, it's like an officials meeting. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's my favorite venue, I think. Oh. I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice track, but it's, yes. it's also, it's also ho one of our homes. Well, is there somebody you, you hope to meet in, in an interview that you haven't met yet? The greatest race I ever saw, and I keep going back to this, yeah. and I have actually met him, was the New Zealander Murray Halberg winning the 5,000 meters in the Rome Olympics. And the reason that really fixed itself in my imagination. I was there, I was a 20-year-old student, up in the crowd, sitting surrounded by Germans who were all chanting for Grodotsky, the German. Murray Halberg made his break with three laps to go and just went and, was cl and hung on to that lead. And I thought, as somebody with no sprint, as I told you, I yeah. thought, maybe I could win races that way. Oh. And, and ultimately I did. And when I set, a, I set a record in the Surrey County three miles, I did it like that. I went two and okay. a half laps from so, home. Uh, so you were a student. So you, you, you were tried. a student of these other runners. Well, you have to be. If you don't have talent, <laughs> Steal from you, the best. you've got to think about it <laughs> and figure out, figure out how to do it against the people who actually are more talented than you are. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, listen, let's jump ahead. <laughs> Because you, know, you have this book out, The Spirit of the Marathon. I think it's based on the, on the uh, DVD or the uh, DVD show? Yes. It's, uh, John Dunham, the director, made a wonderful job with the first Spirit of the Marathon film and then with the second one, which is based on Rome. Marathon is the biggest, totally peaceful community activity in human history. Visually, it's stunning, as you know, you've seen it, and the shots of Rome are just absolutely spectacular. Oh, beautiful. And when John came to our house to interview Catherine and me, he and I kind of had the idea, wouldn't it be a good idea to have a background book? Because in a film, you only ever get a few words, and you can't really tell the full story. So we decided that I would produce a book which would amplify things. So when in the film Abebe Bekila's 1960 marathon in Rome is mentioned in the book, I can tell the full story. And he did it at Barefoot, I believe. Barefoot, amazing. Yes, on cobblestones. Yes, yes. <laughs> and these days at the Rome Marathon, and in the book we tell this story, they like runners to take off their shoes for the last 50 meters of the race and finish barefoot as a tribute to our baby Bikila. And quite a lot do, apparently. I've not been there myself. Okay. And then the book also fills in background on the various people who are interviewed in the film. You know, there, there, there's Bill Rogers, there's Frank Shorter, uh, there's Nina Kusick, there's Catherine Switzer, there's, there's uh, Haile Gebre Selassie. And, and so I've done Hal Higdon, John Bingham. I've done profiles on each of those people so that the people who see the film and they would say, who was that? Yeah. You know, because it just flashes up. It just says, yeah. uh, you know, John Bingham 
the penguin or something. That's right, something. that's right. So I've done a profile on him, little life story, kind of page and a half life story, so that people can go and say, well, oh, that's who he is. Yes, okay, now I, now I understand why he was in the film. Ah. That was the idea of it, as well as telling in brief form the story of the modern running movement. And in this, in this particular film and book, the story of women's running, particularly. Yes. So yes. both of those are there. So it's, uh, it's not a full history, but it's kind of brief and I hope readable. Well, we should tell the audience that you're married to Catherine Switzer. We should, we should say that, yes, that's right. We've been married for 26 years. I better get that right. Yes, 26 years. <laughs> Going on to 27. Well, it won't surprise you to know that we met when we were both speakers at a marathon, in fact, in Canberra, Australia. It's now, Canberra is the government capital of Australia, and when, okay. when we're giving speeches in Australia, we like to amuse the audience by saying we're the only people in the world for whom Canberra is a romantic location. <laughs> And the Australians all roar with laughter at that because they okay. think of Canberra as being utterly boring as okay. a government public service centre. But Catherine was there, I guess, was supported the Avar because she was very into that at the As time. it happened, that particular race, it was the Canberra Marathon. The women's race was the, it was an Avon race sponsored by, and Catherine was there, so sponsored by Avon. The men's race was sponsored by Nike who when, I never got any money from Nike, I wasn't that good, but they used to sometimes pay my fares and use me as a speaker. So I was brought over from New Zealand to be the speaker there. And, uh, and, and so you and Catherine... Uh, the sparks were struck. Really? So who made the first move? Uh, that, that's a matter of race tactics. <laughs> 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 I did present her with three apples. That's because of she, she was identifying herself in those days with Atalanta of the Golden Apples, you know, the story in Greek, in Greek myth oh. where Atalanta was the great runner and Melanian beat her by dropping golden apples in her path, okay. three golden apples. So I did actually, before I spoke, but the other line I had on that occasion, and you know what Catherine looks like, in those days, she, her hair was in its natural state, lion's mane, and, and I was on the way to how I am now. <laughs> and, I, and I said, if you, looking back on this occasion, if you have difficulty remembering which was Catherine Switzer and which was Roger Robinson, <laughs> she's the one with the hair. It's <laughs> a lion's mane. I'm sure she's going to enjoy that, that description. So, so that was, that was the, the, the first meeting. Yeah. Oh. Now, you two obviously perform a partnership in terms of uh, not only your lives together, but going out and talking about uh, marathons. And since I retired from the university, um, I'm trying to concentrate on my own writing, both running writing and, and scholarly literary writing. I'm still doing some of that. You know, did a, a paper at Cambridge last year about the oh, writer Samuel okay. Butler, and I still write reviews, and, and so, so that writing is still going on. Um, but we do like traveling together and performing together, and, and we, we will arrange that as often as we can. Excellent. And, and it's great working with her. On things like at the Boilermaker, for instance, when she'll be on the women's, on the women's motorcycle covering the women's race and I'm in studio kind of coordinating it, I know you can absolutely 100% rely on Catherine to get it right, to tell you what colors they're wearing, to tell you who's leading, she would get, it's nice to know that you can really totally rely on somebody to, to do it well. Yes, yes. I read her book. It was fascinating yes, yes, how yes. thorough and uh, knowledgeable she is. Yes, yes, indeed. You guys are a great match. Yes, well, we, we, we like working together. Okay. Yes. What are some of your future challenges that you envision for yourself? The next book, essentially, um, that we really need a book on the running movement on how it happened, and I've got all the material, and of course I was in it in, in, in various ways. And this book, Spirit of the Marathon, tells some of it, Here is the Sparrows tells some of it. Uh, but we need a book which goes back to say 19, I think you'd really start with Abebe Bikila, perhaps 1960, and, mm -hmm. then, and then pick the story up in the 1960s and try and tell modern runners how utterly different their world is. So you have no idea just how primitive it was and what a tiny group it was. And people thought we were eccentrics. You know how important cricket is in England. Well, there was going to be a big cricket match at the Cambridge University ground and all the top writers are there and it poured with rain. Well, 
on Saturday morning, we were due to do our training, and the old cinder track went round the cricket ground in those days at Cambridge, before it went, they had a 400-metre track. And England's greatest cricket writer wrote in the Daily Telegraph the next day, writing vividly about the rain, and he said, nothing was to be seen through the streaming windows except the lunatic fringe training around the athletics track. <laughs> and, I was, always to and that was us. That, we were the lunatic fringe. Anybody go out and run in the rain? I mean, you must be out of your mind. Oh, it's <laughs> wonderful to run in the rain. So, yes, that's the next book, I think. And a lot of the writing I'm doing now, I have a column online once a month for Running Times, which is called Roger on Running. And in that, I try and deal with some of the topics, like I've written about volunteers, I've written about spectators, I've written about what's happening with cross-country, I've written about drugs, I've written about, i had one called Who Runs Running? How is the sport really controlled? Yes, you know, yes. who, are, who are the, the power brokers? Yeah, yeah. So I tried to cover those topics which will ultimately go into the book. Uh, so that's the next challenge, is putting that together. But the real challenge, then, is getting people to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully uh, today we helped on that. I, I highly recommend Spirit of the Marathon. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to reading the book. I understand you had a knee surgery a few years ago? For my, my knee really began to hurt when I was about 65, and it got worse and worse. And in a, in a stubborn kind of way, I, I, I hobbled on and would even occasionally run a a race or two badly. And then finally, I couldn't run at all. I just could not, it hurt too badly. And th just over three years ago now, I had a partial replacement. It was done extremely well by the surgeon in New Zealand. Um, and he advised me not to run, but he himself is a great believer in exercise, and we agreed that I would cycle and walk and so on. And I started to slowly experiment and do a little bit of running. And now I'm running most days. I can run an hour, an hour and a half. I run some races. The speed is only the pace that I used to warm up at, but, but, but never mind. I'm still... You're happy. And I occasionally place or win an over-70 age group. I'm happy as Larry, as they say in New Zealand. <laughs> so knee replacement is not necessarily the end. But obviously you did it very, very slowly very and carefully. Cautiously, very cautiously. Ten paces, uh, <laughs> and then and then. Does the doctor know? I guess he'll thing. know after. He does. Uh, he found out, yeah. <laughs> and, and I had to confess. And he and he said, "Well, our advice is proper caution. We've never met anybody quite like you, so go for it. Be careful." And I run on soft surfaces as far as I can. Oh, great, Roger! Thank you so much for coming in. This has been a pleasure. Well, a great pleasure talking with you. Excellent. And, and good luck with your running. Oh,